After a lot of days where I've talked about women's wrongs, gosh am I ever thrilled that the powers that be assigned me a day talking about women's rights. Question for ya. Who do you consider to be some of the most influential women in history? Let me know your opinions in the comments, and here are some of the gals I consider to be icons. During China's 15th century Ming Dynasty, Tang Sayer, a young girl from Putei, or present day Shandong province, was taught martial arts by her father. She married an itinerant named Lin San and joined the White Lotus Society, a secret religious and political order, becoming a local leader. Now, her world changed when she lost her parents and then her husband at a time when the emperor imposed heavy taxes and flood and drought ravaged the land. Not one to stand by and do nothing, she raised a peasant army in 1420, successfully fighting Ming soldiers. In some accounts, she won a battle by creating a flying demon army out of paper dolls. When she was at last defeated, she fled and was never found. Some tales say she was captured but could not be harmed or killed by any weapon. It was also said that she had disguised herself as a Buddhist nun. All such nuns in the area were arrested and questioned, but the rebel commander was never found. Hats off to her. Most of Japan's stoic, highly disciplined samurai warriors were men, yet one of the most famous ones was a woman. The story of Tomo Gozen, or Lady Tomo, is known primarily from the Tale of the Haiki, a history of the 12th century Genpei War between two families, the Taira, also known as the Haiki, and the Minamoto. She was a samurai of her warlord husband or lover, Kiso no Yoshinaka, also known as Minamoto no Yoshinaka. Tomo was described as a fearless rider whom neither the fiercest horse nor the roughest ground could dismay, and so dexterously did she handle swords and bows that she was a match for a thousand warriors, and fit to meet either god or devil. With her help, Yoshinaka triumphed against the Taira, but then his family turned on him. He found himself battling his cousin at the Battle of Awazu in 1184. Tomo was with him on the battlefield until only five warriors remained. Yoshinaka ordered her to leave him as he lay dying, but she seized an enemy soldier in a powerful grip, pulled him down against her saddle, held him motionless, and twisted off his head and then threw it away. Then she dropped her armor and rode off out of history. Come on. You can't get any cooler than that. Celebrated for her intellect, political cunning, and ability to speak Portuguese, Nzinga Mabande defined much of the history of 17th century Angola. When Portuguese slave traders threatened her homeland, she was asked by her brother, the king, to negotiate a peace treaty in 1622. At the meeting, the Portuguese provided her with a mat on which to sit, implying her inferior status to the governor. So what did she do? She motioned for one of her assistants to kneel on her hands and knees to serve as a chair, establishing her equality and negotiating the treaty. Upon the death of her brother in 1624, Nzinga became Queen of Ndongo, against tradition that, at the time, declared only males could rule. Go Queen! The vast kingdom of the Mbundu people, and went on to conquer the nearby kingdom of Matamba. Quickly proving herself to be an incredible monarch, she formed alliances with former rival states to fight the Portuguese in what would become a 30-year war. But she wasn't just a royal leader. She prepared young soldiers by leading them in arrows and spears war dance exercises. She also personally led troops into battle all the way into her 70s, holding the title of general. Now. She wasn't exactly the greatest person on the planet. She used Christianity as a diplomatic tool and adopted those customs into her court. And from the 1650s onwards, she increasingly relied on Christian converts at her court. She appropriated the aspects of the ideology and culture and added those to existing traditions to create a new class of counselors that were loyal to her. She also began practicing Catholic-inspired rituals, placed crosses in places of high honor in her court, and built many churches across her kingdom. Why did she do all of this? Well, she wanted to convert her people which I have issue with. The efforts weren't without controversy, and some conservative religious figures kind of pushed back against this. And in response, she empowered her Christian priests to burn the temples and shrines of practitioners who opposed her, and ordered that they be arrested and turned over to her for trial. Traditionalists were dismissed from her court, after which she sentenced them to public thrashings. Several prominent priests were sold as slaves to the Portuguese, and she was like, I want them shipped overseas. And then she used those prophets to furnish a new church. Some of the wanted priests managed to escape the purge and went into hiding. Eh, look, I was all for her until she forced people to convert to Christianity. That's where I draw the line. But she's still a fearsome warrior that should have been mentioned today. A medieval queen who demonstrated great strength against all odds was Tamar of Georgia. Reigning from 1184 to 1213, she is recognized as one of the greatest national figures in Georgian history. The novelty of her rise to the throne is shown in the fact that she was crowned King Tamar, as the Georgians had no word for a ruling queen. Despite strong opposition, she managed to consolidate her reign and turned her attention towards her country's borders. Now, she waged war against the 
El Ghazids, a Muslim emirate in modern day Azerbaijan, and established a client state there to secure her borders. She then set about liberating Armenia, drawing the eye of the Sultan Suleiman II. Despite the superior strength of the Sultan, her generals were able to win stunning victories against the odds, their queen acting as a prominent figure of Georgian and Christian strength to inspire her men. Now with Armenia and everywhere else subdued, she turned her eyes to the crumbling Byzantine Empire. The Fourth Crusade had seen the city of Constantinople sacked and the empire in ruin, so she took initiative by establishing the Empire of Trebizond as a vassal state. Her military exploits allowed Georgia to exist as an independent kingdom, only falling to the Mongols in the 13th century. But even after her death, this incredible queen lived on as a symbol of Georgian nationalism, a figure of great Christian importance and one of the greatest female rulers of all time. Although it was not uncommon to see warrior women on the front lines defending the Soviet Union, there are special cases where individual females rose to great prominence throughout their exploits. As was common with those heroes, Maria Oktyabraska had humble beginnings. In 1925, she met and married a cavalry school cadet named Ilya, and after Ilya graduated, Maria led the life of a typical officer's wife, never being able to settle in one place, constantly being moved around. After the outbreak of the German invasion, she was evacuated to Tomsk while her husband stayed to fight the Yahtzees. Sadly, he was killed in action on August 9th of 1941, and Maria filed a request to be sent to the front. She was initially denied because of an illness she had suffered from since she was young, and also 36 was considered too old for her to be on the front lines. But she was determined. She sold everything she had and saved up enough money to buy a T-34 tank. She sent a telegram to the Kremlin, personally addressed to Stalin, explaining that she bought this tank, it's mine, and I'm going to donate it on the condition that I'm the one to drive it. Which incredible. So in the autumn of 1943, she graduated from the tank school as a driver and with the rank of sergeant. With fighting girlfriend emblazoned on both sides of the tank, Maria and her crew took part in the battle for the village of Nove Selo in Belarus. They performed admirably, killing 50 German soldiers and officers as well as destroying a German cannon. Fighting girlfriend was hit and sadly became stuck in a small ravine, but the crew continued to fight on for I think it was two days until the tank was retrieved. In January of 1944, Maria and her crew saw heavy fighting. The tank's tracks were damaged as and as Maria tried to fix it, a mine exploded nearby, seriously injuring her. She was taken to a hospital where she remained until she succumbed to her wounds on March 15th, and she was eventually buried on the banks. She was posthumously awarded Hero of the Soviet Union, and I can't think of any better honor for her. Prudence Cummings Wright came from a family of loyalists in 18th century Massachusetts, but she believed in independence for the colonies. When her husband joined others from Pepperell in marching off to fight against the British after the battles of Lexington and Concord in April of 1775, she was elected leader of a woman's militia known as as the Mrs. David Wright's Guard, with the mission to defend the area. When she learned her loyalist brothers and others were smuggling information from Canada to Boston, she prompted military action. As the spies crossed the town's covered bridge, she led the women in seizing their documents and holding them prisoner, preventing the British in Boston from learning about American troop movements. Boudicca, the queen of the Iceni in East Anglia, Britain, didn't set out to be a warrior. But after her husband, the ruler, died in 60 BC, the Romans thrashed her and forcibly subjected her daughters to intercourse, and Boudicca had no choice but to make a stand. She she raised an army and destroyed Colchester, London, and St. Albans. Well, that's what they're known as today. I couldn't manage to pronounce the older names. Roman historian Cassius Dio describes her this way. In stature, she was very tall, in appearance most terrifying, in the glance of her eyes most fierce, and her voice was harsh. A great mass of the tawniest hair fell to her hips. The British faced their retribution in 60 or 61 BC, however, when the Roman general Suetonius met them in battle. Boudicca led from her chariot, exhorting her soldiers to fight or to become enslaved, but she and her army were defeated. Apparently, she then eventually took poison, but that was never proven. Time to talk about a Greek legend, and that's Penthesilea. The Amazons of Greek history present the original portrait of women warriors. They were a society of women who forswore the society of men, except to mate with them for the purpose of increasing their all-female tribe. Many are the stories of their bravery in battle, though Greek writers seem to have made use of them simply as valiant enemies to be defeated in battles. One of their bravest leaders was the ferocious Penthesilea, gold belt fastened beneath her exposed upper part body, warrioress, and a maiden who dares to fight with men. Honestly. Sounds incredible. Here's a gal I couldn't leave off of today's list, Joan of Arc. The time was early 15th century. The place, France. Caught in these seemingly endless French and English battles over territory and succession to the French crown, Joan, who was just a farm girl, felt compelled to act. Relying upon her faith in God and the guidance of long dead saints, she took her courage in hand and led French troops in many battles, notably to victory. After her capture, she was tried for heresy and burned at the stake. Can't leave her off of a list of incredible women. Lady Fu Hao was one of the 60 wives of Emperor Wu Ding of 
ancient China's Shang Dynasty. She broke with tradition by serving both as a high priestess and a military general. According to inscriptions on oracle bones from the time, she led many military campaigns, commanded 13,000 soldiers, and was considered one of the most powerful military leaders of her time. The many weapons found in her tomb support her status as a great female warrior. She also controlled her own fiefdom on the outskirts of her husband's empire. And that's it for me once again. I've been Alexa, your resident emo girly. See y'all next time I buzz in over here at Bumblebee. Thank <laughs> you.